He disappeared in the dead of winter. The brooks were frozen, the airports almost deserted, and snow disfigured the public statues. The mercury sank in the mouth of the dying day. What instruments we have agree. The day of his death was a dark, cold day. These are the lines, the opening lines, the opening stanza from W. H. Auden's very famous poem in memory of W. B. Yeats. And these lines somehow came to my mind today, January 30th, 2022. It is at this very time, 5, 12 p.m. on January 30th, 74 years ago, that Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was felled by three bullets fired by Nathuram Godse. A few hours ago, I did a book talk on another book called Gandhi is Gone. Who will be, who will guide us now? Today I want to take up another book called Speaking of Gandhi's Death. This is a book published by Orient Black Swan and it's edited by Tridip Surud and Peter Ronald D'Souza. So Tridip Surud is a former director of the Sabarmati Ashram and he is now the provost of a private university in Ahmedabad and he is one of India's most well-known Gandhi scholars. He has also translated many other works from Gujarati literature. He has done a critical edition of the Hind Swaraj, of Hind Swaraj and of Gandhi's autobiography. And Peter Ronald D'Souza was the former director of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study. And some 10, 15 years ago, so in fact, this book is actually published, I see, in 2010. So the proceedings must have been in 2009. And what I'm referring to is the proceedings of a, I think, conference on or workshop is perhaps not the right word, the proceedings of a meeting, a kind of a conclave that Peter took, put together at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study in Shimla to talk about Gandhi's death and how we think of Gandhi more generally. But let me begin with the fact that Gandhi was killed at 5.12 p.m., approximately. That's my recollection on the evening of January 30th. We know the time because when he was felled by the bullets, he fell down. And the stopwatch, the timepiece that he, that was tucked into his dhoti, hit the ground and time stopped. What is the meaning of the fact that time stopped? It did stop in a fashion. The country came to a standstill. I think the heavens must have rumbled, if I may put it, put it in this odd language. There was some recognition that things were amiss. I have read accounts of the fact that people even outside India wept when they first heard the news or read the news. And as I mentioned in my previous talk, in India, a silence enveloped the country. There are many accounts of how people felt at that time. 
And we are also fortunate that at this exceedingly unfortunate moment, some of the world's greatest photographers happened to be in Delhi. The mass of humanity that was present at Gandhi's funeral was captured by the camera of Henry Cartier-Bresson. Margaret Bourke White, who did an extraordinary book called Halfway to Freedom, was in Delhi at that time. She took one of the some of the last known photographs of Gandhi. Some of the most iconic photographs of Gandhi were taken by Margaret Bourke White. And one of these days I will share those photographs since I have that book in my collection with the viewers of my videos. We also have a great Indian photographer who in fact had really sharpened his skills traveling through Bengal during the Bengal famine in 1943 when he accompanied a really great artist by the name of Chitta Prasad whose sketches of the Bengal famine are extraordinary and furnish us with a real narrative of the horrific nature of that famine, what some would call a genocide. But Sunil Jana was not in Delhi when Gandhi was shot dead. He was in Calcutta, but he captured the sentiment there. There's a famous photograph of him where you see a mass of people and you see these, you know, black umbrellas because it's raining. And then you see one person holding aloft a newspaper. I think it was Amrit Bazar Patrika with the headlines splashed across the first page of the death of Gandhi. But really, I think the question of the question of Gandhi's death being at 512 before us is, what meaning do we read in the stopping of the watch? And I think there are a great many other questions wrapped into this which have to do with how Gandhi is interpreted through time, in time, but also what was Gandhi's own relationship to time. We all have a relationship, although we don't think of it that way, with space and time, the two vectors of all discourse. And in the case of Gandhi, there are many different registers of time that we have to think of. The one that I really wish to only draw attention to briefly before I go to the subject matter of the book is Gandhi's own attitude towards time. Because there's no question to my mind that although the demands on his time were enormous, he never, incidentally, said he was busy. How often we use that word? Busy, busy, everyone's busy, God knows doing what most of the time. But despite all these demands on his time, he always made time for everyone. I think that is one of the most astonishing and less commented facts of the personality of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Now this conclave that was put together, it's a very interesting set of conversations. We, and I dare say that these books, I think, are far more intellectually engaging than the biographies that people love to write. We already have thousands of biographies of Gandhi. I have no doubt that many more will be written because it is obviously an epic life. The subject is inexhaustible. 
And we have the view that new research will continue to yield new insights. I won't comment on whether I think that this is at all an interesting point of view. But one thing must be said is that biographers usually don't have an argument. They don't have to worry about an argument. You just take the life as it is. Of course, you then decide what you're going to present, what aspects you will highlight, what aspects of a person's life you will obscure, what will be in the shadows, what will be in the sunlight, and so on. This book, I think, offers startling readings and insights of Gandhi, some having to do with the meaning of his death, some having to do more broadly with how we think about the contours of his life, what he bequeathed to the nation, how he has been received in subsequent years in India, how he continues to be received today, and what I propose to do is to look really at the comments offered by four of the many scholars and thinkers who were present at that conclave. The late Dirubai Shait at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies was present there. Ashish Nandi was present there. Sadanand Menon one of India's most well-known writers on art, music, and dance, Ganesh Devi, a leading public intellectual in India, who has also been critically important in uh, numerous domains of scholarship, including, of course, the massive project that he initiated on a new linguistic survey of India, but he has also worked actively to try to make the country sensitive to those who are still considered to be part of the criminal tribes and castes, a category, of course, invented by the British in the 19th century, in the late 19th century. Also present at this meeting were Sudhir Chandra, an Indian literary critic and historian, the late Mushir ul Hassan, the vice chancellor of Jamia, University in Delhi, um, and Rajiv Bhargav, who, like Dhirubhai Shed and Ashish Nandi, has had a long relationship with the Center for the Study of Developing Societies. But what I propose to do here is to actually really look at four sets of comments, those briefly, again, those by Ashish Nandi, Sadhanand Menon, Mushirul Hassan, and Rajiv Bhargav. Though in the case of Rajiv Bhargav, what I'm really going to convey here is the, the gist of a conversation he had on January 30th, some years ago, perhaps a year or two before um, the conclave, when he took a taxi and engaged the taxi driver in a brief chat. When we turn to the question of Gandhi's death, there, is a, there are some set of questions about, of course, what does it mean to describe someone as immortal, right? Because this was, of course, the way in which Gandhi was perceived at the time of his death. And we know that there are extraordinary tributes that were paid to Gandhi after his death, not just in India, but across the world. Some of these tributes are very interesting for not the usual kind of reasons. Uh, the tribute that came from Muhammad Ali Jinnah is a very interesting one because he said that the loss of Mr. Gandhi, of course, he always referred to Gandhi as Mr. Gandhi, as did the statesman. Jinnah was not one, obviously, to call Gandhi the Mahatma or Bapu, 
or by any other endearing term by which he was known to friends, followers, countrymen, and countrywomen. But what is most interesting is that Jinnah says, well, the loss of Mr. Gandhi is a great loss for the nation of India, but in particular for the Hindu community. So even, even in the time of Gandhi's death, Jinnah in some fashion could not stop communalizing Gandhi himself. Now, this gives me the occasion to launch straight away into the first set of comments, and those are by Mushirul Hassan, who passed away as a consequence, really, of an unfortunate accident, a road accident. He's a prolific historian, uh, wrote widely, really, on the colonial period, and was a person who was really sensitive to what we might describe as not only the history of Muslims in South Asia, but to such things as print cultures. So in a very interesting book that he did on the Avad Panch, which was a magazine that was produced, um, you know, and there's a whole tradition of magazines which took off after the uh, magazine Punch, which came out from England, of course. And they were literally, you know, maybe a dozen, two dozen variations of this in different parts of uh, the empire um, and some in India. Now, Mushir al Hassan um, takes a very different position on Gandhi, which is why I thought it would be worthwhile beginning with him. Because what he argues here is that Muslims in India did not largely identify with Gandhi. So he says on page 46, and if you were to look at history after 1947, and here I speak in the specific context of the minorities, Gandhi has not been appropriated the way he should have been. Muslims generally have not identified themselves with Gandhi. They identified with Nehru. And he goes on to say that, I, and I quote him, he says, I find Gandhi very inaccessible. Right? I build, we ima so he says, let me, let, me, let me just go back a little bit, because here he's speaking about a question of accessibility. We feel that Gandhi is more accessible while Nehru is not. Nehru is inaccessible according to us because he uses Western vocabulary. He speaks of secularism, of democracy, of socialism, and he speaks of industrialization, while Gandhi speaks of the labor and the peasant. And we presume that for this reason he is naturally accessible. I believe that it is not so. We imagine that it is so, but to me personally, both as a student of history and as a member of a minority community, Gandhi appears largely inaccessible. This is so because the language that Gandhi uses, in large measure, though not entirely, is localized, the language of Gujarat or of this region. Now, I don't want to dismiss this point of view. And he goes on to say that Dalits also similarly find Gandhi inaccessible. And that again has to do with the language. So Mushir al Hassan is referring in part to Gujarati, but he's really referring to what we would call the languages of modernity, that Gandhi, given his critique of industrialized modernity, becomes really inaccessible to the Dalit worldview, right? I don't think that we should really dismiss this altogether, but it is interesting that he makes this observation because 
although I have read in a great many books and articles the fact that Muslims were not receptive to his invocation of Ram Rajya, for example, his frequent references to Ram or Krishna. Right? I've read that in many places that some Muslims were turned against Gandhi on account of that. I think that that is in itself something of a shallow view, partially because the assumption there is that something like the Ramayana does not belong at all to the Muslims of India, right? That it resonates not at all for, for Muslims of India and more broadly South Asia. And I don't think that that's the case at all. Right? But D.L. Shait gives a spirited response. And what he points out, of course, is that, that Mushir ul Hassan is really representing an elite Muslim view. So Dhirubhai Shet quite correctly points out that one of the largest followings that Gandhi had was in the Northwest Frontier Province. Now you could say that of course his following was because on, because, uh, on account of the fact that Bacha Khan or Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan was a person who had really accepted Gandhi's mentorship. He looked up to Gandhi, and Gandhi in turn would eventually say at some point that Bacha Khan is the perfect exponent of Satyagraha. Right? But one could say, of course, that, that the Pratans were following not so much Gandhi, but they were simply following Bacha Khan. But this, of course, in turn leads to the, this in turn is, is based on the assumption that they were simply people who emulated their leader and didn't really give much thought to the whole idea of Ahimsa. But we have to see what a, what a disciplined cadre the Kudai Khidmatkars were. And then, of course, we can say that if we are to take Mushirul Hassan seriously when he speaks about the inaccessibility of Gandhi, well, how did Gandhi become so accessible to the Dalai Lama, to the Tibetans who have immolated themselves? but who have held up Gandhi's name? How did he become so accessible to African Americans during what is called the Civil Rights Movement? And one could speak in this vein of many other such movements where neither the worldview that we associate with Hinduism here, for the sake of convenience, I just put it in the singular, nor such practices as asceticism or the deployment of fasting, that if you take all of these, that there are a great many people around the world to whom all of this was something foreign. The worldview of Hinduism, the idea of a certain kind of rigorous practice of ahimsa, but nonetheless, they embrace the teachings of Gandhi in some fashion or the other. We find Rajiv Bhargav reflecting on this question in a different kind of way. So if we turn towards the end of the book, the very end of the book, um, we find Rajiv Bhargav, who is a political theorist, talking about a number of things having to do with the death of Gandhi, how the anniversary is marked, what is the meaning of ritual. All of this, all of what he says is quite absorbing. But what I want to really do is I want to relate here a conversation that he has with a taxi driver. So 
This is on pages 125 to 127. So he says towards the conclusion, a last word about the Mahatma. This is something which is very strange because it is continuing even today. He provokes or invokes hatred. I think in 2022, we don't need to be reminded of that. This was this book is more than a decade old. Matters have become worse because we know that Gandhi's assassin, Nathuram Godse, is being glorified. And glorified not simply by the hoi polloi, by the masses on the street, or some people on the street. He's being glorified by Hindutva ideologues. He's being glorified by many who today exercise political power in India. Right? So the G. Bhargav continues, he provokes and invokes hatred. This is something which I find very puzzling in some ways, that here is somebody we revered, who is prepared, aware, and who fell to a bullet. Right? So let me pause here because this is where a lot of the writers here have reflected on the fact that Gandhi had always been preparing for his death. You know, the one point of view which I had articulated in my, in my previous talk was that not simply that Gandhi had a premonition of his death, but that Gandhi's assassination was a permissive assassination. That some portion of the Indian elite was in fact complicit with it. Right? That the bullets that were fired came not just from Nathuram's revolver, they came from us. Right? This is part of the discussion in this book as well. But some have stated it more strongly. Sudhir Chandra, for example, says in this book that Gandhi was dead long before he was assassinated. He was dead because partly he was being instrumentalized by a great many people who had no interest in the idea of ahimsa as a matter of creed, as a matter of belief who simply embraced Ahimsa as a matter of policy. That people adopted the externals of what they took to be Gandhi's ideas, which is what, of course, is done in India today. The political leaders on January 30th, on October 2nd, will even make a show of spinning for five or 10 minutes. They'll have themselves photographs with a charka. All of that. We had rendered Gandhi dead long before he was shot dead. That's what Sudhir Chandra says. So Rajiv Bhargav now continues, whose hatred is it? Of course, there is self-hatred. There is malicious and spiteful hatred because hatred is visceral. It's almost verging on hurting. It's hurting ourselves and hurting the other. I can't quote the entire passage at length, but I want to come to the portion where he talks about his conversation with the taxi driver. Right? So he gets into a taxi in the morning. Rajiv says, I'm not a social scientist and I'm not an anthropologist, but the little field work that I do, I always do when I come to the city and I ride a taxi. And this time was no different. So the first thing I asked when we got in was, so what's happening? And he was saying, what happened today? Basically, he was saying, what is the connection between Gandhi and 30th January? It was as if he was feigning complete ignorance about what happened today. So I said, don't you know, aaj wo shaheed hue. He became a martyr today, on this day. So he said, acha. And I asked, didn't you know that? To which he said, no, I didn't know that. So I asked, when were you born? He replied that he was born in 1966. So I remarked that it was odd he didn't know that. I was still thinking I was a fool. He knew it bloody well. He said, nobody remembers Gandhi. To which I asked, do you remember Godse? He said, yes, a lot of people remember Godse. We carried on our conversation and I probed a little bit further and he said, what did Gandhi do? He did two things. 
First of all, Gandhi was not the only one to fall to a bullet. He was not the one who threw the British out. End quote. He said many more things, but I'll stick to these two points, says Rajiv Bhargav. He was not the one who threw the British out, and a number of other people also fell to bullets. Why do you make such a big deal about Gandhi? And the second thing he said was even more interesting. It is because of Gandhi, he said, and it ties in very well with a lot of other things said here today about caste and Dalits, that all the backwards are where they are today. They're in the government. All the government jobs are filled by them, and it's because of Gandhi. So I said, but isn't Mr. Modi from the other backward caste? This is before Narendra Modi became the Prime Minister of India, but he had been, of course, the Chief Minister of Gujarat. And he said, yes, he's a Ganchi, but I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about basically he meant the scheduled castes. He said basically those people. They are where they are because of him. So it is very interesting, says, it, says Rajiv Bhargav in conclusion, that in the public imagination, there's a very strong connection, at least my fieldwork shows that, between Gandhi and the emergence of emancipation. These are very big words of the Dalits. This is, of course, quite contrary to the view that was voiced by Mushidul Hassan. And this brings me then to the last two people whose views I want to look at briefly in this book. One is Sadanand Menon, whom I've introduced as one of India's leading and most interesting critics of art, music, dance. And some of this will not now be entirely novel in view of what I've said both in the preceding half an hour and in my previous talk. But Menon says, in one sense, from the moment of his consecration as Bapu, Gandhi lived that life. See, there's entropy, right? All science believes in entropy, as he says. There's a birth and there is death. And Menon's preceding remark is, Often we see in our indigenous systems that at the very moment of birth, death is inscribed into, say, a temple or a vigraha. Death is inscribed into the very moment of birth. And that is why, among some Buddhists, every time your birthday falls, it is drawing you one year closer to your death. But let me continue quoting. His death, says Sadhanand Menon of Gandhi, was already inscribed into his living practice, and I think that either he was perennially trying to commit suicide or there were perennially people hounding him and baying for his blood. So in that sense, the death was imminent. That kind of death, that kind of violent death, we sense a contradiction or an oxymoron in that. And when it happened there was a profound silence. What Sadhanand Menon continues to say here is that he has over the years witnessed all of these rituals that take place at Gandhi's death, right? The rituals that take place not just at Rajgat, but the rituals that take place at the Gandhian institutions. Right? And Menon suggests that all of these are completely oblivious to the spirit of Gandhi himself. Right? Because Gandhi was a man who was, I will use this phrase, always in the hermeneutic machine, by which I mean that He's constantly interpreting, reinterpreting everything. 
It is not an accident. That is autobiography, and this goes back to the 20s. You still live till 48, 1948. Is the record of his experiments with truth. What Menon says is that in India, we cease experimenting, frankly. We have no idea how Gandhi would have reinvented himself. Maybe I shouldn't use the word reinventing. Everybody is reinventing things. But how would Gandhi have played with the idea of Satyagraha? The idea of play is very important in Gandhi's life. The sense of humor. And on Gandhi's death anniversary, it is important to think about humor too, I want to say. If you read his letters here in the Gandhi ashram, Menon says, there were people like Rajkumari Amrit Kaur writing this letter saying, Bapu, I'm not able to sleep well at night. I have this permanent cold. What should I do? To which he replies, perhaps that is because of your propensity for silk and underwear. Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, you know, Rajkumari after all, she came from a very aristocratic family. She was a princess and she liked silk saris and all of that, but she was also a very close follower of Gandhi. Likewise, Dr. Shushila Naya writes to him that when so and so person passes by, I'm not able to control my longing and passion for the person and his one line answer, that is Gandhi's one line answer to her is, go take a cold water bath. <laughs> right? I mean, th this is Mohandas Gandhi. But he's saying, Menon says that when you go to these Gandhian institutions, you know, Khadi and village industries set up on the Khadi and village industries model, the rural development models at Varda, Sevapuri, Gandhi Gram, all of these. Where in Gandhi's time they were self sustaining, where the labor of the hand was understood in a different way. Now, what has happened to these institutions? But when you visit these places today, they are like bombed out sites. They are centers from where, for example, cotton yarn or khadi or paper, soap, matchboxes, ceramics, and carpentry is produced. But these ventures are either completely abandoned as projects by those who initiated and ran it themselves, that is, these Gandhian institutions, or they have become relics of some kind of archaic notion of production with the entire abandonment of the idea of labor developing your body, your mind, and your soul. Gandhi was a philosopher of the hands too. I have been to so many places associated with Gandhi. You go to Rajkot, you go to Porbandar, you go to a Gandhian institution you'll see a cupboard or two or three with Gandhi's collected work, some other books on Gandhi, locked. Nobody's opened them for 20, 30 years. They wouldn't even know who has a key anymore. This is what I call the Tala Sanskriti, the lock culture. These people who run these institutions, many of them, they have locked out knowledge, insight, entirely. And that is part of the continuing story of Gandhi's assassination. That he was shot in person, his ideas, the little that remain of them, continue to be murdered every day. Sometimes murdered, sometimes simply ignored, obfuscated. And so finally I come to Ashish Nandi with whom this volume opens. So the first lengthy set of remarks and then he intervenes on a number of different occasions. And we know of course that Ashish Nandi has had unique insights into Gandhi. 
for people like my generation, this is something I will speak about on a different occasion. For people of my generation, Gandhi would have been all but dead had it not been for the way in which Ashish Nandi breathed life and spirit into Gandhi's ideas, his worldview. So I won't elaborate on his views at any great length, but I want to stress only one thing that he says, and I quote here. Today, there is an all-round attempt to make Gandhi respectable. I see a lot of young faces in front of me. I hope you will avoid the temptation of seeing Gandhi as someone respectable, as somebody that your parents would like you to be like. I dare say that Gandhi doesn't, that no one has to really worry about that anymore. I doubt there are any middle class parents in India today who would want their children to be like Gandhi. They want their children to be bankers, engineers, software engineers, computer scientists, doctors. They want them to mint money. They don't want to have their children squander their time thinking about an ethical life. They don't even want their children to actually squander their life over anything called thought. It's far too laborious and unproductive to engage in thought for the most part. Nandi continues, I would rather that you see Gandhi as disreputable, unpredictable, at the margins of sanity and at the margins of everyday life. Someone who dares to ask questions about what we take for granted, who dares to ask you to look even at your everyday life and your public life and ask, is it possible for us to envision, to re revisualize or imagine a different kind of public or private life? Is it possible to live everyday life and yet look beyond its everydayness? And is it possible to contaminate your everyday life or the life of the people around you with that vision? I think that this is really in the spirit of Gandhi. And I think on the occasion of his death anniversary, we can reflect on some of these matters as Ashish Nandi says, in fact, he starts with this, January, 30th January in some ways is a much more important day than 2nd October. Unfortunately, 2nd October is a national holiday. 30th January is seen as a day of mourning while 2nd October is a day of celebration. I propose to you that 30th January should also be a day of celebration. In the Puranas, in Indian epics in general, there is mention of only seven people who are immortal, Amar. And this list of seven does not include all the people we think would be there. Thank you.